pray to God alone and on the throne. We pray that God will do a work today in the hearts of people in regards to abortion that happens at Planned Parenthood. Abortion is taking a, a life of an innocent child that's within the womb. We pray that God will intervene and change hearts, change laws, and that those that would be contemplating this would change their minds and save their child. That is the greatest joy that someone can have is to be able to give life an image bearer of God. It's a gift from God. And Every time we take a life through the form of abortion, whether through a pill or surgically, we are murdering a child. And so um, if you do not think that it is murder of a child, just think about what happens within its first week. Within the first week, you can determine the sex of the baby. You can know whether or not your baby within the first week is a male or female. Your baby is known by God, was known by God before it was ever created within the womb. And once in the womb, the baby has its own DNA, its own identification. You can find genetic traits that, that can be determined within its first week. The embryo, embryo travels from the fallopian tube to the uterus. Within the second week, the egg is implanted on the wall of the uterus, and the placenta develops. The third week, the heart begins to develop. That's within 18 to 25 days. That's when the majority of these abortions take place. The third week, the brain develops. The intestinal tract begins to develop. Within the fourth and fifth week, the, the vertebrae begins to develop. Blood flow begins. Eye development begins. Arm and leg development begins. The umbilical cord begins to form. Within the sixth week, which many people use as a defense of abortion, they say, well, in the, the six weeks, it's just a cell, a, block, a clump of cells. But within the six weeks, Fingers and toes appear. Nose and ears develop. Joints are developing. No problem. Within the seventh week of, a, of, a, of pregnancy, all essential organs are now developing. Eyelids are forming as a baby is being aborted. The eighth week. Muscle, muscle contractions occur. Facial features become more prominent, and the heart has four chambers. The ninth to twelfth week, the baby is about three inches long. The neck develops. Arms and legs begin to lengthen, and genitals are well defined. Within 13 to 16 weeks, the baby is about 6 inches long. Hair begins to develop. The baby moves. Lungs develop. The female, the ovaries contain about 2 million eggs. Think about that. The baby at 13 to 16 weeks, the female has 2 million eggs. The face is more developed. The baby can suck his thumb. As you're considering abortion, I want you to consider this, to think about, this is what your child looks like right now. The 17th, the 20th week, the baby is about 8 inches long. Eyebrows have now formed, and nails in the fingers and the toes. Movement can be felt by the mother. And just to be make it clear, even if the mother did not feel the baby before this time, the baby is there. The, circula the circulation system is working now. They can swallow. Within the 21st and 24th weeks, the baby is about 11 inches long. The baby weighs about one and a half pounds. 
finger is formed. The baby can hear and react to sounds from outside the womb. Now think about that. There, it's doc, there are doctors, there's actually a doctor here in Maryland that will murder a baby in the name of abortion at this point in, in the baby's development. 29 to 32 weeks, the baby is about 16 inches long, weighs about four and a half pounds, and all bones are fully developed. 33 to 40 weeks, the baby is about 18 to 21 inches long. The baby weighs about six to eight pounds. The baby is ready to be born. And yet, there are doctors that are willing to abort or murder this child at this point. This is the reality of what's happening. So why should we value life? Psalm 103 verse 3 says, Know the, that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and his, the sheep of his pasture. Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus says the Lord, our, your Redeemer, the one who formed you in the womb. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth alone. So no, 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 not only are you having having committing an act of murder against a baby that's within the womb but you are also committing an act of murder against a living God who created you and also who you will stand in judgment to Isaiah 64 8 says but now O Lord thou art our father and we are the clay thou art our potter and all of us are the work of thy hand. So who is the creator of the preborn? Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you, speaking about God, formed my inner parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, and I fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And, and that my soul knows well, my frame was hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book they are all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Within the mother's womb, God forms, God knows, and God loves that child that's within the womb. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. God has a plan for those even from the womb, and it is not to be murdered by their parents. How is God concerned with the pre-born? Well, we look at the scriptures, the very words of God. Galatians 1, 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, I had and called me through his grace. Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for giving us through Christ every possible spiritual benefit as citizens of heaven. For consider what he has done. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us to become in Christ his holy and blameless children living in his uh, constant care. Are the pre-born human beings? This is what the depravity of man would like to to tell us. They would like to tell us that they are not, that they are a clump of cells, that they're nothing but uh, pieces of, of flesh that have not formed yet. They can't feel, they can't think, and therefore they are, are, are of no value. But yet if you can have a DNA at the moment of conception, the moment the embryo is formed, 
how can you claim that it is nothing more than a clump of cells? A clump of cells can't have its separate DNA. Luke 1 41 and verse 44. When, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, saying, As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Luke 2, 6-7, the Lord Jesus Christ began his incarnation as an embryo, growing into a fetus, infant, child, teenager, and adult. While they were there, time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to the firstborn, a son. So who is responsible for life and death? Exodus 20, 1, and verse 13. Then God spoke all these words, saying, You shall not murder. Now let us be clear about something as well. Jesus clarified what this means. The Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not murder. Now if you abort a child, whether it be through a pill or other methods, surgery, that is murder. You take the life of a, of a human being that has its own separate DNA, it has its own body within a body, you have murder. If, if, a, if you were pregnant, even if it was within the first few weeks, and someone enters your house and stabs you in the stomach, killing you and the baby, what would be the charges? The charges would be murder, two counts of murder. Murder of the mother, murder of the baby. So how is that any different for a doctor that puts a knife within the butt of the womb? It's the same thing. You can't, you can't have a logical, you can't have these fallacies and come at us with these uh, ideologies and say that to defend your case. There is no defense. The same justice you would demand for the man that walked into the room and, and murdered the, the woman and the child with a knife or a gun, you would demand justice for them. That is the same justice that is hanging over your head when you commit abortion. But Jesus also said that abortion, that murder is of the heart. It's also the intent of the heart. When you come here to plan on aborting, you have murder in your heart, and therefore you have already committed the murder. So even even before you walk in those doors, you know what you're doing. You know what's in your heart. You know what your intention is. You want to be, you want to find convenience. You don't want to be inconvenienced by taking care of another child. You have life to live, you might think. But yet murder is in your heart. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Are humans permitted to take life or birth? But let's look at the scriptures, the very words of God. Exodus 21, 22 through 25. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. This is the very words of God and how he views the taking of a life in the womb. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their, their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. So should a child conceived as a result of rape or incest be aborted? But there's your response, right from the very words of God. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, or their children be put to death for their fathers. It 
it's tragic when those things happen and our hearts break and we, we cry out for justice, uh, and for the person to be brought to justice. But that is not the fault of the child. It's still a life. And one sin, one evil act, does not give uh, you the, the benefit of do, committing another evil act without receiving the same justice as the one who committed the atrocity of rape. Should a child who might be born deformed or disabled be aborted? And look at Exodus 4.11. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? We live in a fallen world. Things aren't perfect. But yet God is the one who creates, and he knows why. And he knows what that child's destiny is, what the child's purpose is. A de a de deformity or a disability does not mean a, a death sentence. Look how many have contributed to our society that have disabilities and deformities. So in spite of a fallen world, God can still use the beauty of disabilities, deformities, in order to display his glory of how he can use the least of these. We look at what the, world, the, the word says as well in the scriptures. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say, he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what have you begotten? Or to his mother, what have you brought to birth? This is the, what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker. Concerning the things to come, do you question me about my children? Or give me orders about the work of my hands? Isaiah 45, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 1 through 127. Yet to shame the wise, God chose what was in the world counts folly. And to shame what is strong, God has chosen what the world counts weakness. So God uses the weak, the disabled, even weak men who are sinful to be able to show, display his glory. For that is the reason why we exist, is to bring glory to God. How can you glorify God if you are taking the life of his own creation? So how should a woman view her, her body and the preborn life growing in her womb? Well, let's look at the word of God again. Psalm 127, verse 3. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-21 Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, in looking at all these verses that we see from the very words of God that describe a child, a child in his womb, and it's a life, and that taking a life is murder, is there forgiveness for your past murderous acts or the one that you may be committing today? There is, and it's only through Jesus Christ, it's only through repentance, which means turning away from your sins, not justifying your sins, not using grace as a license to continue in your sins, not to say, well, I'll commit the sin today and I'll ask forgiveness later on. It doesn't work that way. We look at the scriptures, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption. Talking about Jesus Christ. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So therefore, there are there is forgiveness for your sins, your lust, your 
sex outside of marriage, for homosexuality, for, for abortion, for our lying, our deceitfulness. But where does that salvation come from? It doesn't come from your works. It doesn't come from your, your own abilities. There's nothing you can do that can gain forgiveness and salvation. Everyone thinks that they're a good person, they're able to go to heaven. Even those that kill a baby will say that they're a good person. Because maybe they thought, oh, I'm giving that child a better life. I can't provide for them, or whatever their excuse could be. But none of your works can get you to heaven. And if you don't believe that there is a heaven or hell, one day you will know. Because every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that they are sinners, and that Jesus Christ is the at the end, you will be judged for everything you have done, and you, there is an eternal punishment for your sins. Jesus actually spoke more about hell than he did heaven. And in that hell, you will bear the wrath of God. That wrath of God will be terrifying. It's complete separation from God. Complete separation from any hope of knowing of, that you can be redeemed. It is being reminded <clears throat> for all eternity of every sinful act, every sinful thought that you've ever committed or thought about, every word you've ever spoken. And knowing that it is sinful, and yet never being able to receive forgiveness for it. But there is hope. Jesus came, God. He was He's God. And he came to dwell among his people. He walked with us for 33 years. He lived the life that we could not live. He endured every temptation that we would ever endure. He saw our wickedness face to face. The creator with his creation. Sinning against him. Every single day, he endured it. He was a man of sorrows that carried the weight of seeing all that he's seeing, his creation that has rebelled against him. And yet for those that he knew before the hands of time, before they were formed in their mother's womb, he came for them to purchase them, to redeem them, to pay the ransom, that the payment that was, that was owed. We owe a debt because we have sinned. Every single one of us are sinners that have committed atrocities against God. Romans 3 says that no one is good, no one is righteous, no one seeks God. You may seem to think that you uh, are seeking God. You may think that you have some kind of relationship with God. But most often it is the God of your own imagination, the one that doesn't, that tolerates your sins, the one that is, looks like what, the one you want, want to look like, the one that will, um, that will give you a free pass to heaven, even though that you continue to live like a devil. We, we seek his benefits, his peace, his mercy, but we don't seek him. This is the reality of who we are. In Ephesians 2, it says we're actually dead in our sins. In Romans 5, it talks about that we are, we are actually enemies of God. Need of need of reconciliation with him. See, everyone's got children of God. We are created in his image. We are of value. But we're enemies of God. And he's angry with the wicked every single day. And yet God is not like us. He is able to love his enemies and die on the cross for their sins, bear the wrath that they deserve, and to provide salvation for those that he knew for the hands of time and chose and said you are mine are you that one today are you that one that God knew before the hands of time and chose you and died for you bore the wrath that you deserved him? and Jesus paid the, the, the fine that you needed to pay if you were that person today is the day for you to repent of your sins and turn to Christ your faith in him. He's the only one. There is no peace without Jesus Christ. And the word justification is a beautiful word for those that have been justified. 
for those that have not been saved and justified, the word justice is terrifying because if you want justice, every single of us, one of us, deserves hell. That would be justice. You commit a sin against the holy God. The, the, the payment, the, every, the, the wages of sin is death. Oh, but the grace of God is great. And when Jesus died on the cross for the sins, when we repent and cry out to him and ask for forgiveness of our sins, we flee from our sins, we hate our sins, God justifies us, making us right with him. He declares us righteous. Not because we are righteous because of our own works or abilities, but because he clothes us with the righteousness of Christ. It's as if you were standing before a judge, deserving the death penalty. But Jesus stands before you and says, I got him, this is mine. He is mine. She is mine. And instead of God looking at this wretched sinner, he sees his son. He treated Jesus Christ as if he lived my life. And he treats me as if I lived Jesus' perfect life. That is grace. Unmerited. Undeserved. gift is always available to those that he foreknew the one that he also justified and he calls them he's calling those today perhaps people that are listening right now if you are hearing that call it's time to repent of your sins if you're in the Planned Parenthood contemplating to murder your child not only can you save your child today but today Christ can save your soul and so we cry out for you to your soul. We pray for you. We're here not because we want to condemn you. That is not our job. Jesus said that I have not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And why did he say that? Because without him, we are already condemned. I don't need to say it. It's already done. In our, in our natural state, we are condemned. The wages of sin is death, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. But the grace of God is able to, to do a miraculous change in our hearts. He's able to give us a distaste for the sinful things of this world. He's able to change the things that we used to love for the things that He loves. And in doing so, He also adopts us as His children. We were once His enemies, and now considered children of God. He seals us with the Holy Spirit. God Himself is here willing to the believer to help us to, to live a life that we can't live on our own. It convicts us of our sins, that guides us, directs us, changes us, changes our desires, makes us more like Christ, gives us more love for one another. That is what a true believer is. And in doing that, we long for the day where we will spend eternity with Him in hell, in heaven. We know that the world is corrupt. We see injustices. We see conflicts ever since the beginning. When Cain and Abel, there was murder. From the time of Babel, there's the divisions. This is the result of our sinfulness that man loves. And uh, this is the thing that we. We, we, we know that this world has many things beautiful, but it also has so many things that can cause us to be distraught. Just look at the news and what's taking place on the news today. There's hopelessness in this world. People that are able to do whatever they want, according to them. They can sit away from the sun, and yet they're unhappy. Because there's nothing that can set By bringing Lord to God through our feet. Because that's how we create. The only reason why you exist is to give glory to God. If you're not giving glory to God for everything you're doing, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, everything, then you can't do the rest of the things. You can't truly love your neighbor. You can't, you can't do any of those things if you're not glorifying God first and foremost by the way you live, the obedience, your repentance. Your desire for depending on Christ 
One day this world will dissolve by fire. The heavens of the earth will be restored. Everything that we see here that is beautiful will be restored to its perfect state before sin corrupted it. But for those that reject Christ, it is internal then it damnation and come. This is what we do not want to do. We do not want to see go to murder today in Planned Parenthood, and we don't want to see the souls of people lost in hell for eternity. Because of our great love, that is why we're here. Because of our great love for your soul, because you have value and you are an image of God, we are here to proclaim the gospel to the good news to lost people. If that's not love, if someone, if you knew that someone, if I believe this is to be the truth, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, the very words of God, and everything in it is truth, then you expect me to share that truth with you. Otherwise, it would not be very loving. I don't pray to you today, please. Do not hurt your mouth. Please repent of your sins, all who are listening. Turn to Christ. He's the only peace that you will find, and the only justification that you you can find is in Jesus Christ alone. And without Christ, there will be no peace. And the only justice that we will receive is the very the wrath of God. So let us pray that God may do a work in your heart. That these children. Not just here while we're here today, but every single day that people will be convicted of their sins, convicted of what they're about to do in murdering their child, that the, those that operate Planned Parenthood will realize this, the, the, we at this place will be transformed into a place that will no longer murder babies. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for giving us breath in our lungs. We can live every single baby that, that is inside of parenthood right now and those that will enter one day. We pray, Lord God, that you will convict the hearts of those operating Planned Parenthood that we, that, and those that are going in there to leave abortion, to murder their child. And even those that maybe are going into murdering their child, we are going there. Appointment, a checkup, or medicine, or other, other disorder. But how can you support an organization that is murdering children? In other places, you can just empty your hearts, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, you will, that you will regenerate hearts, that you will change hearts that are stone cold to the gospel. And that you will break that stony heart and that you will turn it into flesh that has a love, desire, and faith in God. That they will repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ alone. And that they will seek you because you are seeking them. They do you because you them. And that they will repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ and find a, a biblical church here in this area that will be able to disciple them and guide them to rest and lead them at a journey to be more like Christ. Take the hearts of these people, Lord God, that are committing murder against me. And we know that you can do a great work in hearts of people. For if you can save a wretch like me, you can save anyone. We thank you, Father, for us to honor and privilege to a You don't need us. But you command to do this because you, you use your people to be your hands and feet to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Faith from here, hear the word of God. And so we pray that every person that hears the word of God today will be transformed and that will turn to Christ. In Jesus' name. Those that are going into Planned Parenthood, please turn away from the place they are doing there.
sea, aquellos que están en Planned Parenthood y están matando, ellos uh, matan bebés. Si alguien está ahí que habla español, Planned Parenthood, abor aborto es matando un bebé, una vida. Salga de este lugar y arrepiéntese de sus pecados. Salva tu vida. Es un regalo de Dios.